Hi, everyone, and welcome to Crim2 News at Noon. It is good to see you. I'm Laura Papetti, and we get right down to breaking news. Coming in today, just announced in the last few hours, the mask requirement for state health care settings and correctional facilities. It is now set to end coming up next month. The state health department says the mandate will end on April 3rd. Currently, masking is required in health care, long-term care, and adult correctional facilities. Today, Oregon made a similar announcement. It comes as COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths continue a downward trend nationwide. The state health secretary says masks will continue to be an important tool to keep people healthy, and he thanked health care workers and all Washingtonians for following the pandemic mass measures. It is important to note local governments and healthcare providers may still choose to require masks and several worker protections will remain in place until the federal pandemic response declaration ends coming up May 11th. All right, Alex Murdaugh will now serve life in prison. Just hours ago, a judge sentenced Murdaugh for killing his wife and son. He faces 30 years to life without the possibility of parole. Their voice was heard tonight and justice was brought for them. We can't bring them back, but we can bring them justice. During the trial, Murdaugh admitted to stealing millions from his clients and law firm. The judge threw out the defense's request for a mistrial. Now it is almost certain his lawyers will appeal the conviction based on the judge allowing evidence of the financial crimes. As investigators, we're looking for anything that can tie him to the scene of the crime. New court documents reveal a gun and knives were recovered from the family home of Idaho murder suspect Brian Koberger. The search warrant show what police recovered from the suspect's parents' home in Pennsylvania. And in total, police took 63 items. Here's a list at some of them. Three knives, a handgun, including three empty magazines. They took a laptop, a black mask, gloves, and much more. While many of the collected items, items don't seem to stand out on paper, legal experts say anything can be helpful in a case like this. All right. well, we learned for the first time from this affidavit of what was received by the search warrant that the evidence of the 63 items or groups of items falls into three classifications. Uh, that stuff that's immediately relevant, that stuff that may be relevant, and those items that don't appear to have any relationship to the homicides as we know them. Investigators also collected several items from the suspect's car. These new documents add to the first set of search warrants that were unsealed on Tuesday. The suspect remains in the Lata County Jail. He is awaiting his preliminary hearing, which has now been scheduled for June 26. We have the court documents in the entirety. It is posted on our website, creme.com. All right, taking a live look outside at Riverfront Park. You can see the sun is showing a little bit on this Friday afternoon. And we're going to take a break from the headlines and now turn to the forecast. Here's Nicole Hernandez. So we saw some of those winter weather advisories that we had in place earlier this morning expire about two hours ago now, leaving us pretty clear for the most part here in our Spokane Coeur d'Alene area specifically. Uh, we're left with mostly cloud cover and then just some scattered snowfall here and there over the course of the next few days. So what's happening is we've got this low pressure system off the coast of Washington and Oregon pushing moisture our way. And when it settles down to us, it ends up being just random spots of snow here and there over the course of the next few days. So looking forward to your weekend, we end up seeing those chances for snow as well as below average temperatures with Saturday being a little bit warmer than Sunday. The race for Spokane mayor is heating up. Lisa Brown, the former director of the Washington State Department of Commerce, announcing she is putting her name on the ballot challenging incumbent mayor Nadine Woodward this fall. Creme 2's Amanda Rowley was at that announcement yesterday, it has more on what Mayor Woodward has said now in response. 
Let's create a great Spokane together. Lisa Thanks. Brown launched her campaign for Spokane mayor with a spotlight on a few different issues. She says her top priorities as mayor would include community safety, crime and housing. The temporary deregulation and single family zoning is an excellent start, but we have to build on that at the local and regional level, set targets, make a plan to achieve them, and take advantage of every incentive and program that the state has to offer. She decided to run for mayor because she claims the progress in Spokane has stalled under Mayor Nadine Woodward's administration. The mayor ran four years ago on uh, two issues, uh, homelessness and crime downtown. We haven't made significant progress on those issues and I think people are ready for a change. Woodward responded to this criticism by discussing the accomplishments of her administration, including moving police precincts into neighborhoods and putting more officers on the streets with a new staffing model. Also on the housing front, my administration has doubled the amount of shelter beds in our regional shelter system and just opened uh, at the end of last year, track the Trent Resource and Assistance Center. Brown ran for Washington's 8th Congressional District in 2018, but she was defeated by incumbent Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers. Brown told me she's stepped down from her state job to run for mayor because she wants to be closer to home and build a better community for her grandson. We're already seeing social media posts from Woodward's campaign criticizing Brown's voting record. When asked how contentious we could expect this campaign to get, Woodward said, we'll see. Amanda Rowley, Creme 2 News.